Today, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Irina Nazarenko. Um, she is the head of the Exosome and Tumor Biology Research Group at the Institute for Infection Prevention Hospital Epidemiology of Medical Center University Freiburg. She studied biology or genetics in the Lomosanov Moscow State University, Moscow, Russia. I hope I really tried. Followed by postdoc positions in Austria and Germany. So the main topic of her group is to understand the function of EVs in cancer progression, in specifically uh, tetraspanin-8 and its role in the regulation of EV cargo. She has developed 3D cell models to study EV functionality in physiological environment. And this has recently translated into clinics to study uh, value of different EV population as biomarker carriers. So based on their findings in mimicking EV, her group founded a university spin-off, Capsule Bio, last month. So today she's going to present uh, her talk on a few lessons from the mimicking and modeling of extracellular vesicles in their environment. So uh, please uh, welcome Irina. So what I wanted to say is actually, so this is uh, the first slide I showed that this is from Dolores Davidson on Nature uh, Communication publication from 2018. And um, this is actually how we now may mention the, all the heterogeneity of the extracellular vesicles. And um, what is um, important is we know meantime that they are heterogeneous, they have to different sizes, different origin, and uh, frequently um, we see such protocols for vesicle isolation from cell culture supernatus, like we take cell culture, we isolate by, for instance, ultracentrifugation or by size exclusion chromatography or by mean of other um, um, methods. But um, what is central point on that is it really this upper part cell culture supernatus, because a majority of the um, our findings about the vesicles from in vitro culture are derived actually from um, uh, 2D models or from our cell culture plates. And the question we addressed some time ago, and I'm always asked me actually how to study the intercellular communication in the body actually. We do have the cell culture, but we are um, 3D bodies. So how the, how the vesicles differ from here to there and how to study them. So definitely um, these, some kind of 3D um, systems um, will be required to study the extracellular vesicles in the environment, which may be kind of similar to, the, um, to our body. And here, just an example of uh, 3D structure of um, epithelial cells growing in this period. And, um, but the majority of the um, methods um, known in the literature developed during, through the years were like hanging verbs and 3D matter gel, which can be then done in the matter gel or on the matter gel, were not really applicable for um, vesicle study because um, either the amount of the medium was not sufficient, like in the hanging drops, or in the matrix gel, we do have a lot of contamination with um, matrix gel components. So basically, we started to make a search about how the 3D culture should look like, which prerequisites, which requirements can we think about to study the extracellular vesicles. For which model do we need? And this is just a short summary of our thoughts is uh, we learned that uh, serum and other many factors do contain vesicles. So therefore, um, our 3D environment should be serum free and or EV free. Um, since uh, we know that also dying cells release vesicles, other vesicles, like apoptotic bodies, we need to be able to control cell viability, to control proliferation, proptosis, and necrosis. We would like to have high amount of vesicles because of course everybody who is working in the cell culture knows that um, the um, very higher volumes must be produced uh, to get enough material to study vesicle um, functionality or vesicle content. And it um, must uh, allow the efficient recovery because to, really, to recover the vesicles from matrix gel is barely possible. 
So the 3D system must be um, somehow allow uh, compatible with the vesicle study. And of course, we need the possibility to upscale the approach because if we want to have functional assays uh, complemented by content, we need really a lot of vesicles. Ideally, if we uh, um, go back to tumor microenvironment, we uh, would like to have um, possibility to do microscopy or immunohistochemistry with this system. And of course, going a step further, since um, the tumor microenvironment consists not only tumor cells, but only also from stromal cells, from immune cells, we um, ideally this 3D system must be compatible also with co-culture models, uh, like uh, stromal cells and, and immune cells and tumor cells. So like um, taking all these uh, parameters into the account, we end up with the conclusion, well, there's barely the system which uh, can um, actually can afford these uh, requirements. And then um, um, just by choice, I have learned uh, one of the clinicians in Freiburg who developed such an agarose matrix. And that was quite simple, but for vesicle study, very well um, appropriate um, system. And here you see an example of such a matrix. It's just an agarose which can be Actually, in the first um, trials, uh, it was really manually uh, done. And these uh, matrices can be um, put it into the six well, or it can be adapted to other well formats. Meantime, this, um, um, this um, approach is patented, and the um, intellectual property was sold to the company ABC Bioapply, who is um, also selling these um, matrices for 3D uh, systems. So, but what are to these matrix? So basically, this is just a simple agarose matrix. It's uh, consisting of 950 microwells. And um, um, there are one millimeter space between the cavities. And um, so if you see these cells, uh, they're about like 950 spheroids or aggregates can grow in these matrices. So basically, um, and due to the, um, the form, um, actually, the cells uh, can really form uh, good aggregates and the cells who are able to differentiate can form spirits. So that is how it looks like if you go here. So basically, this is just a 2D um, culture of uh, pancreat, uh, prostate cancer cells. And this is how the um, aggregates in this matrix looks like after seven days. So I showed me basically the point is that uh, to our experience, nearly each of these cell lines we tested was able to grow in such a matrix. And um, by slight variation of the conditions, we were able to, for each of the cell lines, including also non-cancer cell lines to, uh, and, um, to establish conditions which are serum free, or at least with EV free condition medium. And here you see just a histogram about the first differences between 2D and 3D system, which um, a very talented PhD student Lilia uh, has done. So basically it's a very simple, this is just a size. And you see that it, basically that the cells growing in 3D, they are smaller than the cells growing in 2D. So basically then we can ask a question, but what about the vesicles? If these cells uh, produce vesicles, how they look like and uh, what will be the difference? So what um, Lilia has done in the, uh, um, in the uh, frame of uh, training V relative approach, which we adapted actually from Plato 3 uh, publication in PNS. So we compared uh, the, all the different populations of vesicles which were derived from 2D and 3D cultures. And um, after the differential centrifugation by 5,000 G, 12,000 G, 120,000 G, and the remaining um, supernatants, which we know contain a lot of also vesicular components, and we call them like small levies, we um, linear purified by optopropensity gradient and as an analyzed um, recovered 10 fraction of each of the populations. So basically, you can, um, we can count 40 fractions, for example. And um, if you do it in duplicate, replicate and so far, and just um, analyze by mean of um, NTA, like nanoparticle working analysis, you see here that even just a simple evaluation of uh, protein amount and particle amount 
show us the differences in the vesicle distribution between the fraction from 2D and 3D cultures, for instance, the smaller V, so divided by 120,000 G, have by 3D cultures two peaks, and uh, the uh, 2D cultures not, and the same also consider these um, very small vesicles. So when, um, what Olivia has done afterwards suggests um, used TRPS technology to um, characterize the size in more details. And here you see the um, size distribution of um, the, uh, of the fraction of the vesicles which were contained the majority, fraction, uh, majority of the particles. And here you see the distribution by size from 2D and distribution by size from 3D. And um, even by R, you see the differences between the uh, vesicle size and distribution among the size from uh, those vesicles which derive from 2D culture and 3D culture. And here, it might be also mentioned that basically the cells had comparable viability, so they were controlled for proliferation, for um, viability, there were no apoptotic effects so far. So the, this very simple experiment tells us actually that even um, there is a different size distribution among the vesicles which produced by 2D uh, growing cells and by 3D growing cells. So they are likely to have a different size distribution, different um, heterogeneity probably. And um, what about the content? So how, how can the, actually the vesicles which derive from 2D and 3D culture differ in their content? So we know that the cells, tumor cells differ in the behavior of the content, but what about the vesicles? So here's, we did actually this content analysis in many systems in time, but here's an example of uh, breast cancer models. So if maybe for those who are working with breast cancer, you know that it has many molecular subtypes like ruminal A, luminal B, HER2 positive, and frequent. And each of those subtypes does have different prognosis, and um, the percentage of the patient with different prognosis is different. Um, these subtypes measurement differ by, um, um, by receptor expression of estrogen and progesterone receptor and HER2. And the, um, it depends to which patients, uh, to which of the breast cancer subtypes the patient belong, one or another therapy will be more favorable. So there, there are many models of these uh, subtypes in the, um, in the cell culture. And if we just take corresponding, um, corresponding breast cancer cell lines, like MTF7 cells belonging to luminal A, um, the MDMB361 belonging to luminal B cells, Two three R cells, which is triple negative, and the five nine, which is also triple negative, and um, from these um, cells, the vesicles will be produced, like I have described before, from two D and three D culture, and then um, the statistical analysis will be done. Just simple statistics, and we look how the vesicles um, actually differ in their content by prior. And um, what um, it's um, clearly seen is actually if we just uh, perform clustering analysis of all the vesicles and look whether we can, by vesicle content, differentiate between um, breast cancer subtypes. Because always it's um, the issue of potential application of vesicles of biomarker. They must be uh, um, applicable for, of course, differentiation between uh, subtypes. And here you see that while the vesicles which derive from 2D culture, if we compare luminal B versus luminal A subtype, or triple negative versus luminal A, or um, two different cell lines, actually the 2D culture is not allowing to, to differentiate between uh, those two. But um, the 3D culture um, allows to build clear clusters. And this is um, one of the examples of um, different by content of the vesicles which derived from 2D and 3D cells. So then we can conclude that AVs derived from cells growing in 2D and 3D, 3D architecture different their content and their burning content. Um, to, further, to, to further understand um, about the impact of the architecture, we also analyze the function and um, I'll give you an example of one study which we had done together with the University of Porto um, with a group of um, Carlo Oliveira. 
So we used um, gastrointestinal cancer model to study all the functionality so the, the release for organ function. And um, here you see just uh, the same picture. So it was the uh, uh, matrixes. And here you see two um, gastric cancer cell lines which build aggregates which have quite similar architecture as the cells derived in the tinograph in mice. And um, what is important is that, first of all, uh, quantitative analysis um, showed that actually under 3D conditions, the cells produce more vesicles, and they are slightly smaller as 2D, and this we also saw also in other um, cell models. And the second, um, of course, we could um, also show the same differences in the baryon content and also the differences in microRNA signatures from vesicles derived from 2D and 3D uh, system disregarding the cell lines. So there are similar changes in different cell lines. And um, what is I think first important by analyzing the um, signaling pathways which were affected in the vesicles um, by um, change of architecture we found that our six signaling pathway is um, underrepresented, so those proteins which belong to the R6 signaling pathway, they were underrepresented in the vesicles which derived from the 3D culture. And um, we got the help of uh, really very talented um, bioinformaticians who did a comparative so network integrated analysis of microRNA profiles and the Burning performance, and um, he could recover that actually that those microRNAs, which are upregulated under three D conditions in the cells, they are also overrepresented in the vesicles, and their corresponding target proteins they are downregulated in the vesicles. So it's an obvious response of the cells by the um, microRNA regulation, and consequently. RNA expression at protein levels, which affected the um, content of the vesicles, um, but the change of the architecture from 2D conditions to 3D conditions. And if we would test this, the function of these vesicles, and this is just a simple example of the result of the uptake of these vesicles by um, um, epithelial cells, you see that um, there is a one cell line in PN45 where the vesicles derived from 2D and 3D culture differed in the uptake efficiency, but another one not. And the same um, also regards the cell invasion. So basically, the um, cells under the treatment of the vesicles are derived from 3D culture very faster, but it was not the common uh, phenomenon. So basically, um, we could say in the conclusion that um, the matrix in the 3D conditions, like 3D positive matrices, are applicable for EV isolation, analytic and functional characterization, that um, using the 3D microwell array, more EV per cell can be isolated in a considerably more cost and effort efficient manner. And the 3D environment is likely to trigger release of smaller vesicles. This increased amount of microRNAs and decreased amount of the entire proteins. And the functional impact of 3D environment on EVs is really different between the cell lines and should be analyzed individually. So we, um, after this, actually, we now continue uh, using this 3D uh, system in different um, contexts. You see that really that the 3D um, environment impacts um, to very high extent the properties of the vesicles, their content and also functionality. And um, I think this is also one of the um, issues which um, I hope will be also addressed by um, other groups in the community, really to study how, um, how the 3D like vesicle derived from the 3D architecture um, really function. And um, if we're talking about the more, models or um, mimicking some environment. We also um, asked uh, some simple um, questions, uh, well, because the vesicles currently are really like um, enter the therapy and there are a lot of groups who are working with um, 
vesicles in a view of therapeutic application and loading of vesicles with um, RNA or with other molecules, with drugs. And this has become a really huge and highly um, interesting topic. So many years ago, actually, I was um, asked uh, by engineers, so what is about the vesicles? And vesicles are just bubbles. So that was a view of engineers about the vesicles. And they told, they told me, well, if we take just, if we start to mimic the vesicles, we can just take big capsules, they are empty, or they can, we can fill them, they put it on the cells and we prepare their vesicles. So we discussed it actually very much with the engineers and I told them, well, you'd understand nothing about the biology. And um, so then finally we did the very simple experiment. We took the capsules, put them on the cells, and this is how it looks like. So nothing spectacular happened, the capsules were large. And um, if we look how the cells react on these foreign bodies, it looks like that. So basically, it seems like the, some of the cells do uptake these large capsules, but nothing really happens in the capsules again and again up and down or they are moving. And actually, this is clear that the cells don't like this capsule. So um, then we decided, well, if we if we mimic just the very, um, I would say, the very like minor properties of the vesicles, what will happen? So if we just can see the size, so we know that the, the people who work in this um, small extracellular vesicles, they are about 100 nanometer of diameter, they are um, negatively charged, so you have uh, the, the, the lipid bilayer, and um, those capsules which I showed you before, they were actually hard. They were out of some polymer, which are really hard. So if we made the capsules biodegradable, so soft polymers, which are like, um, it can be used for biomimetics and um, biocompatible. So this is um, what one of the engineers was able to perform. So what um, she did is she took the, uh, first of all, calcium carbonate four, and she um, make a layers from polyarginine and dextrone, which both are biocompatible and biodegradable. And then she did very simple things. So she put it, the um, sRNA on one of the layers and covered it again with polyarginine to keep the charge negative. So after that, we have like a synthetic, capsule synthetic vesicles, and if you remove the calcium, um, calcium work by, for instance, filating the calcium by DT, you will get as a synthetic vesicle, synthetic, synthetic capsule, which is, has similar, um, similar physical properties. So basically they are um, synthetic, they are soaked, and they do have a negative charge. And we put it on the cells. Actually, I was very skeptical because for me it was just a synthetic body, so nothing interesting. And um, so this is the scheme. So the, the engineers wanted to have so that if we have like a small capsule, which is 100 to 30 nanometer diameter, where you can put the RNA or DNA or whatever layer, and we put it into the cells, what will happen then afterwards? And we did such an experiment. So we transferred um, the sRNA, just blurs and sRNA with these non-capsules, subacrone capsules from the cells, and the result was quite amazing, so basically. Here you see the uptake fluorescence, and here you see the degradation. So indeed, so after four hours of the uptake, the all the capsules were intact. After 24 hours, the half of the capsules degraded. And then after 48 hours, about 80% of the capsule degraded. And here you see that the all cells actually in the cell force are turned green, and um, which, um, indicated the transfer of the RNA, this um, labeled control assignment. Um, we did further the uh, similar experiment, but just transfer the probabilistic RNA also to test, to test the functionality of such a capsule for synthetic mimetics. And um, performing the similar experiment with just regular transfection reagents and you can put them out to thousand and with vesicles, oh, with, with capsules loaded with this RNA, we 
four selections and the effect which capsules um, had were um, significantly higher and we could um, really kill ourselves by just, um, just uh, treating them with capsules. So that was quite an interesting, to my consideration simple, but interesting experiment showing that actually by mimicking just very uh, like um, very simple um, properties of the vesicles, which is the size and the charge, we can um, really um, enrich very high efficiency of transfer of some genetic material, first of all, without any um, specificity. So because we tested um, any, any cells we took, they react in a very similar way. And here you see the transfer of GFP coding mRNA. So basically the same experiment was done not with this RNA, but with mRNA, so capsules were loaded with mRNA and then the cells were treated. And um, that worked um, absolutely um, efficient. So that was um, quite an interesting for us and then we decided to test uh, for the, um, um, like some, um, I would say some tricky cells, which actually barely possible to transfect or not possible to transfect. There was T cells. So, and um, the experiment was as, um, very amazing because indeed these like um, vesicle like biodegradable capsules were able to transfer um, the mRNA to the cells with a very high efficiency. And so you see the transfer of green um, mRNA. And the same uh, was observed also with, um, with the crispr cas so if we loaded the capsule with uh, crystal cas uh, construct, the efficiency was as high as, um, as with control products. So it was quite interesting because, of course, the um, synthetic um, vesicle-like capsules are much easier to produce as vesicles. They are very cheap and very efficient. And, um, the, uh, um, and they can be, their um, content is absolutely controllable. So we can put any of the um, RNA or SRNA in the capsules and um, then um, test them in different systems. So basically, based on this um, experience, um, the university startup company was built just in May 2020, so recently kept for bio. And um, so if, um, well, probably um, they will also present uh, when the products will be available with uh, such capsules, vesicle-like capsules for further transfer. Uh, and on this, I would like just to, um, to finish and um, to thank you, of course, for your attention and thanks um, my group who is working great and, of course, collaborators. And um, here, the Carlo Olivier, with whom we um, developed and worked on the 3D culture. And this is Jana, the engineer who developed this vesicle um, like uh, mimetic synthetic mimetics with a very high transfer efficiency. And I thank you for your attention and um, can um, um, ask for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Irina. Uh, could I could I start off by asking what the uh, what the uh, spin-off company? That's always interesting and curious. What the spin-off company aims to do, and uh, and what the uh, long-term uh, business plan is for that. So the um, spin-off company first was uh, generated as um, research use only because it's very fast and simple. Because with this such a capsule, um, the guys can really um, like mimic or that do better transfection reaction and gene delivery um, reactions very very simple and very fast. And long term is of course a therapeutic application, um, which require in any case longer development and delivery process. So this is really like, like long term purpose. I think which many I thank you um, many people will pursue. Clotilde, you have a, a very good question there. Please unmute yourself and ask the question live. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, well, thanks, Irina, for this uh, very nice, interesting presentation. So my question was about the 3D culture and the fact that you have uh, smaller, you, you see smaller vesicles released by these cells. You did the proteomics, so do you have any idea whether these smaller vesicles are exosomes rather than 
or, or I mean, coming from endosomes or whether they come from the plasma membrane? Um, unfortunately, we, we actually don't really know. So basically, the, um, the first proteomics analysis were done on the regular um, 120,000 G pellets. And currently, the uh, uh, proteomics and further analysis, like gene and um, also um, DNA or RNA content analysis, they are ongoing for, the, for these very small vesicles. And uh, the um, behavior and the density gradient are similar like other vesicles, but we unfortunately don't know the content yet. So this is what we are waiting for, to look on the content or on the um, origin of each of the types of the vesicles we, of these four populations. Yeah, let's let's it, bounce the question back to Clotilde and ask her, ask Clotilde, how do you think that question, which is a great question, should be addressed in the best way? No, well, uh, the, the only way with the data that, that uh, Irina has shown would be to uh, see if there is an enrichment uh, in late endosome, lysosome derived molecules in these uh, EVs as compared to the EVs from the 2D culture. But that would only be an indirect way anyway. So then after that, you would have to go through all cell biology, maybe live uh, release microscopy and that kind of stuff. But that, that would be the first, my, my first, the first hint would be to see whether there is an enrichment in late endosome markers in these small EVs uh, from 3D Absolutely. culture. Absolutely. But maybe what I can say already in advance that actually uh, regarding that, what we don't see, we don't see um, some of the tetraspinins like the tetraspinin A, which we're working on, we don't see these tetraspinin in these small vesicles. So I cannot tell about other targets, but for instance, tetraspinin A is present in the, this EV120,000 pellets, but barely, um, barely present in this small, very small vesicle. So we are looking for, waiting for proteomics to guess where they come from, whether they are vesicles and whether they are reaching. Thank you. Did Thank you have follow-up, Clotilde? Sorry? Did you have any follow-up? No, no, no. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, so we have, now questions are coming in. So we have Benedetta. Please unmute yourself and ask yeah. a question about RNA. Yeah, thank you. Very nice, um, very nice presentation. Uh, so I was wondering whether your vesicle, the synthetic vesicles uh, that you showed us, are protected from RNA's degradation. Uh, so the RNA species uh, are protected as happens with vesicle, for instance, in, in serum. Yes, um, they are indeed protected. So and this, is, uh, this you can also manipulate with synthetic um, vesicles and these capsules by changing their size and uh, consequently the porosity of the surface. And in the size between 100 and 300 nanometers, the RNA is highly stable in inside between the layers. So we even tested um, to keep these capsules up to one year in the fridge with this RNA and um, they, it was intact. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So Maya, about uh, the 3D cultures, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, hello everyone. Hello Irina. It's really good Hi, to, to, to hear from you and it was great talk and fantastic work. I remember that you mentioned engineers there a, lo a long time ago. So I was wondering, uh, the, those uh, changes uh, from um, uh, in vesicles from 2D and 3D cultures um, in agarose, special agarose uh, 3D, um, uh, does the, are those uh, changes similar, um, more similar to in vivo situation. Um, did you try to culture some uh, primary cultures and then to compare their exosomes from, uh, for example, affinity isolated from some biological fluid? Uh, so how much does that 3D agarose uh, culturing help us actually to be uh, more related to what's happening in vivo? So this is also one of the questions we are addressing, or actually Lily and her PhD this is addressing very hard. And um, what she's actually doing is she's, 
she's uh, comparing the profiles of the vesicles which are um, isolated from uh, blood, from patient blood, with those vesicles which are derived from um, 3D and 2D cultures. And um, it, is, it, it looks like that it is more similar, and we look now in more details, like um, distribution of different um, mutated oncogenes genes among the population. So, because um, I, I think that uh, knowing the distribution of important tumor and biomarkers among the vesicle populations will help. And if these 3D cultures are more relevant or more similar to, to biological situations, it will be very helpful. Because each of us actually knows how that the results which we get from 2D cultures, they are barely transferable with respect to biomarkers to the situation in the patient. So our hope is actually that this 3D culture will be more similar respecting the content. And this idea of taking the primary cells is very nice so I'm actually looking to um, adopt this culture to organoids. So this is our actually next. <laughs> that was next, actually my follow-up question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That is that is exactly yeah. what we're looking for. Going to is actually making this uh, adopting this system for organoid biobank going to the uh, vesicle study in uh, really from patient one to one. You know. Yeah. That is that is our. Uh, Far go. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, and really nice to hear from you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Sherif Ibrahim, you have a question. Please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you so much um, for this nice talk and great ideas. Um, I, I was wondering uh, about something I'm planning to do in the future uh, about comparing sizes of EVs from different um, sources. And um, I, I'm also worried about these comparisons, how accurate they would be. And if there is a specific um, uh, protocol or technique that's or um, um, method to do, and if there is any precautions in the analysis of data that you advise, so should I be uh, considering? So this is a thing, very important questions, and uh, we we were addressing um, this exactly the same question with a great collaboration with different groups of the community, like with Edith Bouchers and with um, Dirk Strong from Austria, Austria. and um, we saw actually that, for instance, such techniques like NTA, that um, they can adjust or they can help um, in the analysis of small vesicles at about. 100 nanometer diameter, but uh, they are barely applicable or not applicable for the adjustment or for the measurement of the large vesicles. And um, to uh, at the current state, the TRPS, so the Q nano machine from the ISON, where actually the vesicle is squeezed through the pore, works the best because this is really you have to. It's very laborious, so really I spend it really days, hours, and months in the machine measuring the different uh, populations. But since this is a physical method where the vesicle is squeezing through the membrane of certain size, it can, um, it measures the size in a quite a precise way. So we could definitely see a vesicle which um, sedimented by 5,000 G, they are much um, larger than the other. But this is for statistical analysis very important. But for just like a, to look on the vesicle, of course, the direct uh, microscopy, like electron microscopy, is a much, uh, I would say, um, better way just to see the size. You can, it's difficult to make a statistic with this visual method, but of course, to estimate the size, the pure electron microscopy is the, um, is the method of choice because they have really exactly one to one reference to the biological, to the, to the, to the biological membranes. So therefore, um, like for phenotypical characterization, I think still the thing that the pure electron microscopy is one of the most exact methods. And for statistical analysis in our hand, uh, TRPS was the method which is uh, laborious, but uh, quite precise. For, I think this, know, this question comes down to... <clears throat> 
this question comes down also to how to compare sizes, right? And and what the what the best technique of looking at sizes. And, and we know, and you know, Irina, and I think most people around here, don't, MTA is not a good way to look at size. No. Uh, reasonable, <laughs> this... reasonable for quantification, but it's not even really good for quantification for the smaller vesicles. Definitely not for the smaller. So then you start looking into DLS and other faster technologies, right? But if you compare, for example, electron microscopy photographs and measure the diameter of a vesicle and, co and look and compare that with an NTA, there is no there is no good relationship at all. So, I I don't I don't know. I mean, maybe we should have a special discussion about that sometime, Carolina, a uh, a technology session where we discuss yes. size. Just yes, look at size. Just focus on size, that right? Is, that is very important. I think see, this is I can absolutely confirm that NTA was not the the technique where to measure the size. Absolutely not. And uh, yeah. like TPS was. Like, I guess the best way is cryo-electron microscopy, you know, just look at the vesicles. Yes, and absolutely. Them. Or yeah. electron microscopy. But, but it's not I, high I, throughput. It's uh, not high throughput. So uh, I'll, I'll go to the next question and ask Navas uh, to unmute himself if possible. You have had trouble doing that before, but are you okay with that now? Hello. Can you hear Great. me? Great. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Irina, for the very nice talk. And uh, nice to see you after long. We have been in contact uh, since 2014, but nice to see you again. So uh, my, my question is that when we were uh, talking about synthetic vesicles versus the natural ones and uh, 2D versus 3D, uh, I am more functionality guy. So I, I always focus on what is the like function, uh, which, which uh, fraction has the more, uh, which fraction is, functionally relevant, whether it's uh, synthetic, whether it's uh, have uh, some uh, modif modifications, EV mimetic or it's a natural vesicle. So the one that delivers the best is the, for me is more relevant. So that's why my question is that when we deliver uh, some therapeutic molecules, whether via synthetic vesicle or the natural ones. So in, in your system, what ha have you uh, compared between them? Now, which is more functionally re relevant? Um, this is, I think, very important question. So we did not compare directly the natural vesicles, uh, mesosomes with the synthetic one, for a very simple reason. Because to, so our intention in the developing synthetic vesicles was to have a very specific result, like, um, if we do transfer one RNA, then it is really transfer of this only RNA. Because the vesicles themselves, the exosomes or other types of vesicles, they are extremely heterogeneous. Um, I, I doubt that the direct comparison of the transfer efficiency uh, will be really, um, would make really sense. Because um, transferring and taking the vesicles, you transfer the huge, um, functional machinery which affect the cell signaling, which affects the fate of the, of the recipient cells. Therefore, we, we did comparison with a regular transfection reaction. We were like 100,000 fold more efficient in the transfer efficiency. Um, but with respect to functionality, I think if the, for, for my opinion, maybe I'm mistaken, so I would be very uh, happy to hear your opinion about that. It, in, the, in respect to functionality in the therapeutic uh, application, I would like to have a very controllable system. Like I want to know exactly what is in the, what I do transfer. And for that issue, synthetic vesicles, of course, are much more um, easier to handle. Um, and they are very efficient. So they are, so it looks like, and we, we are now actually looking for um, experimental evidence that um, due to the similar intracellular pathways, like the uptake pathways, they actually um, are uptaken in the same way as natural because of their source and their charge, and then the functionality is actually really optimized. But this is only guess. This is really yeah. A, yeah. In this case, like uh, like uh, in, in my experience, that if uh, when you were talking about the sizes, it's also relevant. Like the uptake of uh, each size range is different. 
like mostly people say the endocytosis, like uh, I can tell that like if you have 100 nanometer versus you have 500 nanometer thousand, really the uptake is different and their uh, endocytic fate is also different. So I cannot tell you the more details, but I, I, the, it's, uh, it's more relevant on your sizes also you were discussing. So when you want yes. a control system, you have to find that which uh, of your synthetic vesicle, which size and which topography, the surface topography is more fit to endocytosis because some of will go directly to the lysosomes versus other sides will escape from the endosomal lysosomal pathway and go to the uh, cytos cytoplasm to show the functionality. So it's really relevant, the size. Yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you. And, we'll set you up for a presentation, Navas, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I will have soon. <laughs> so, there, there's one issue in June, I know. There's one, there's one issue with t thinking about extracellular vesicles and liposomes or, or artificial vesicles as only delivery systems. And thinking that the, you know, the, the vesicles have to deliver their cargo to have a function. That's a bias. That's not right, actually. You can kind of empty them and they still have a biological function. So yes. uh, that's also something for, for a topic to, to discuss sometime. And, and uh, yes. you know, microRNAs is not the only molecule that mediate function in, a, in an exosome. There are many, many other molecules, especially receptor molecules. Absolutely. Membrane molecules, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I uh, totally agree with you. Absolutely, yeah, it's yeah. much more fantastic and fantastic phenomenon as we know until now. <laughs> so uh, we'll shift over to Hernando. Could you please uh, unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes. <clears throat> Hello, Irina. Thank you so much uh, for such a presentation. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned organoids because I think they will have a good future in the exosome field. But one question that I have. A have you been able to compare the efficiency of delivery of cargo in 2D versus 3D? I'm asking you this because if we go to organize with the complex cell complexity and different locations, this seems rather an important aspect if you are able to reach the different cells to look for function in the future in these complex organoids. Yes, I, this is a very important question. I really love it. But Unfortunately, I, I have to say we didn't test it yet. So I don't have a reply on that question. So this is one of the things which is, I think, experimentally very important and very hard to, um, very hard to address. We are thinking about uh, tracking with first and markers for genetic uh, labeling of the vesicles, of different populations of vesicles, and then tracking for delivery with the help of crew, um, of the help of CRE systems. So we are planning- but Irina, uh, Irina I'm, thinking, I'm thinking more in terms of vascularization because in malaria, we have the 3D model of the liver and we have seen right. that the delivery is only superficial. So, you know, I think one of the problems that we're going to get is to get in depth into those tissues to get the delivery yes. of all the cells and then look for the function. So I think we have also to start thinking in the vascularization in order to be able to really deliver the cargo in all of the cells of the organelles. Yes. Good point. Well, the only thing I can suggest we can really contact after the talk uh, that, we can, uh, that we can just provide uh, the, the vasicles to test them because we didn't test them in that concern. This is the only thing I can suggest just to test and to look what will happen. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Let's go to uh, Antonella Bongiovanni. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask a question. Ciao Irina. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I really nice enjoy it. Ciao, we are. Good to see you too. Uh, so Irina, I was uh, wondering if you were uh, looking at the helix level in uh, your uh, extracellular vesicle from the 3D culture and if this level is uh, higher than the 2D derived uh, extracellular vesicles. So if there is any difference among the two uh, extracellular vesicles from the two culture types uh, and if it's higher in the 3D, the helix level. The, the what level? The, I, I didn't, acoustically I didn't get what, what level of word, the, the production or the content? The content, the helix, helix the level, helix. Oh, the, the protein, yeah. Well, um, we, 
I don't know, I, I don't remember by heart. So we, we compared definitely the, the, main, um, the main targets, but with respect to Alex, I don't remember by heart. Um, as far as I may remember, it was lower in the 3D, but I have to really like, um, if it is important for you, you can call them afterwards, I have to look in the proteomics data. Yeah, I yeah. My heart, yeah. So eventually we'll contact, uh, so I will uh, yeah. send an email, so we yeah, will yeah. Uh, continue to discuss Just, about it. I have to really look, because we do have like um, 10 different, I would say like 10 different cell lines, comparison proteomics 2D versus 3D of different origin, like breast cancer, gastric cancer, fibrosarcoma. So I don't remember that Alex was one of the prominent targets to be regulated, but this must be looked really in, in, in specifically in each particular model. Okay, we'll discuss. We'll continue. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Asma Mukalfa sending uh, her best wishes and thanks. And that was the last comment of the in the question. So uh, thank you very much.